Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining or watching this recording of RISE Global Engagement Spring Series. So this is the last session of the RISE uh, Global Engagement Spring Series of 2021. We have two special guests today. Uh, we have Kent Moore uh, from CIS Abroad and Rachel Harrison from USAC. So uh, we work with uh, CIS Abroad and USAC um, to send our students to their programs uh, to all over the world. So Clemson does have a lot of programs, but you know the locations and um, what uh, the opportunities might be limited if you only participate in Clemson programs or Clemson Exchange Partner programs. So we work with uh, third-party provider, uh, provider, providers like CIS Abroad and USAC um, to provide more opportunities um, to our students. So uh, they're from uh, two of the approved providers that we work with. And today's session's uh, focus or theme is Africa and Latin American hidden gems and global learning opportunities. So they can um, you know, share their, their programs uh, options as well as the benefits of STEM students going abroad and going to and non-traditional destinations like uh, African and Latin America. So please welcome uh, Kent and Rachel to the sessions. Hi everyone, my name is Kent Moore. I'm here representing CIS Abroad, which is a close partner of Clemson University. I myself am a graduate of another state school in South Carolina that will not be named here. Um, today we're focusing on education abroad, specifically for STEM majors um, and specifically in non-traditional locations. So, uh, a focus on Latin America and Africa. But before we dive into talking about different specific programs and locations, Rachel and I want to discuss some of the benefits of education abroad for STEM majors in these types of locations. Next slide. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna bore you with, with too many details here, but what you need to know is there's an organization called NACE, and it stands for the National Association of Colleges and Employers. And so essentially what NACE has done is to come up with eight competencies for career readiness. So these are essentially the skill areas that students graduating you know, these days need to have in order to be ready for a career in a, in a global workforce. So I wanna highlight a few of these. They're not all applicable to study abroad, although I imagine if we kind of dug deep enough, we would find certain connections. Um, but I wanna highlight a few that I think can be directly connected to education abroad programs, um, essentially competencies that students gain directly as a result of participation in these programs. Can you click once, Yuki? All right, cool. So the first one is critical thinking slash problem solving. It's funny, the one thing you don't hear from students when they return from study abroad is, oh my gosh, I just got back from study abroad. It put me in all sorts of unfamiliar, uncomfortable situations, best decision ever. You don't hear that, which is funny. Um, but what's, what time, wow. What students sometimes don't grasp right away is that yes, they are in unfamiliar situations abroad and they are gaining skills and life experiences from those situations. The seemingly simple task of finding a bus, and arranging logistics for a weekend trip are more involved because you're in another country and the unfamiliarity is amplified when you're in a place that is very different culturally from what you're accustomed to. So places like Latin America and Africa. But by navigating all that, you gain problem solving skills that you wouldn't have otherwise. Similarly, if you're in an unfamiliar situation faced with new ideas and customs, you start questioning why things are the way they are in that country. Then you start questioning things, why things are the way they are in Columbus, South Carolina, or in the US as a whole. And that's called critical thinking. Um, so the more different the host country is from what you're used to, the quicker you begin thinking about these, about all these things and gaining those, those critical thinking skills. So the next two that I wanna highlight are communication skills and intercultural fluency. And they're somewhat connected these are also competencies that students don't often realize they're gaining until they've actually gained them. Communication is obviously foundational in any situation where you're interacting with others, but if you're in a location where your first language is not spoken widely or where um, there are big differences in communication styles, for example, like personal space during communication or eye contact um, or formality versus informality customs, 
you really grow in this area more quickly than you would in an environment where maybe English is the first language and culturally it's very similar to what you're comfortable with. Intercultural fluency is somewhat more difficult to grasp, I think, but generally it indicates kind of an openness and inclusiveness and a sensitivity uh, and ability to interact with all people and understand cultural differences. It's really about navigating cultural differences and accepting them. One quick anecdote from my experience as, as an undergraduate student, I was studying in India and I remember asking um, locals yes or no questions. And what I got in return sometimes was a bit of like a head bobble. You might be familiar with this. And I couldn't understand the meaning of what, what, that, what that meant. Um, I, I wanted to just be like, so is it a yes or, or a no? But over time, I came to understand that sometimes it means sure. Other times it meant that they wanted to say no, but the head bobble was a polite way of saying no. And so I had to pay attention and learn what cues and situational factors were at play to grasp the meaning of the head bobble. Um, and it's something that I learned just by virtue of being in that place that I was very unfamiliar with and interacting with, with others. And when you're in a location that is less frequently traveled to by people where, from where you live, hence non-traditional study abroad locations, I think if you enter into that experience with an open mind or just a willingness, you're, you're going to gain intercultural fluency skills almost by default. So enough of NACE, I'm gonna pass it over to um, Rachel, who's gonna talk a bit about perceptions of non-traditional locations. Sorry, was muted, thank you. Um, so I was, you know, when thinking about how to approach this, I, I went digging through our blog and was, and was surprised to find some quotes that I think really help. Um, I think they speak to what a lot of us think about non-traditional locations and choosing study abroad programs. Um, so I just wanted to share these with you. I know you can read, um, but I'll just read them out. So the first one on the left was a student who studied in Ghana through USAC. And you can see, you know, she said, my mom wanted me to choose somewhere safe. Then I told her I was going to study abroad in Ghana and immediately visuals of UNICEF's portrayal of Africa popped into, into her mind. My brother and mom joked that I would have to write letters and do homework by candlelight. They were joking, but I think they were 20% serious. It took time for her to realize that negative connotations and American perceptions of Africa are far from true and holistic. I'd be in uh, Ghana's capital on a university campus um, with sufficient electricity. So I think this first quote kind of speaks to what a lot of us think when we, you know, a lot of people, when you, when you start thinking about locations where you could study abroad, and if, if someone suggests to you a location like Ghana, um, or India, or Thailand, you may, you know, immediately have these same impressions that it's not as developed, that you, you know, would have to do homework by candlelight, or, you know, it's not as safe of a place to go, um, and so I thought I, I was, uh, I, I was happy to see that she had shared that experience and yet she still, um, you know, took the time to explain what it was going to be like, uh, to her, to her family and that she looked beyond, you know, that original, um, perception when she was looking for programs. Um, so I think that speaks to a lot of, of myths maybe that people have about non-traditional locations, um, that it's, you know, that it's not safe. Well, I think, at this point, we can probably say that there's nowhere in the world that is 100% safe. You know, I'm sure many years ago there was a more black and white um, delineation, but I don't think, you know, obviously there are certain countries you wouldn't be able to study abroad in because there is war, you know, or things like that. But we're, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, South America versus, you know, Europe, there, there's not necessarily these these lines of safe versus unsafe have definitely been blurred and 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 looking at your own country you know what is safe in the U.S. when you know I won't I won't get into that but um, you know just thinking about what what safe behaviors do you have at home that you can take with you and what can you learn about the location when you arrive so that you can be safe you know you'll have an orientation um, where the on-site staff will talk to you about places to go, places not to go, things to do, how to interact with people, um, you know, especially if you're in a place where the culture is significantly different, kind of like what Kent was saying about the head bobble, like how to interpret those kinds of responses from people, um, you know, so you can, you can definitely learn how to be safer in that place. Um, I think another myth that, you know, I hear from a lot of students, well, I want to go, to, I want to travel, so I have to go to Europe, that this idea that like, 
you can only travel if you're in Europe because there are so many countries next to each other. Well, if you look at South America or you look at Africa, there are also many countries you know, next to each other. Um, and also within the country where you're studying that there is, there's so much diversity even within the smallest countries. Um, there are so many different things to see and experience. And so um, you're not, you know, travel will not be limited if you go somewhere outside of Europe, for example. Um, you know, not having modern conveniences like the student said, she's not going to be doing homework by candlelight. She's going to be living in a, you know, a modernized uh, student residence hall. Um, you know, there is electricity and running water and all of those kinds of things. Many of these places where you're studying may be, you know, maybe in like Ghana, maybe a, a, a less traditional country. And but the city of Accra is, is urban. It's very, you know, it's large. It's very developed. It has, you know, transportation and all of the things that you would expect. Um, and this, and again, I mentioned this first, but this idea that it's not diverse or, you know, with, even within a country like Ghana, there are so many different types of people and different um, cultures within, you know, a, a smaller country. So there's, there's so much that you can learn and experience, you know, outside of, of Western Europe. Um, and then kind of speaking to that was this other quote that I can, that I had found from a student who um, was, you know, talking about her study abroad or her, her journey to finding her study abroad program. Um, and she said, listening to the people I love and trust the most talk about such an impactful experience gave me a final push. After making the decision, I decided to tell a few close friends who also deeply appreciate traveling. They were thrilled and asked me where I was going to study. And I said, I'm not sure, but I think Spain. Spain was a destination where I'd seen so many people study abroad and it felt like the place you go when you decide to study abroad. Um, so I think that that, she ended up not going to Spain. She ended up studying abroad in South Africa and in India because she took a moment, you know, to not just do what she'd heard all of her friends were doing. Um, and she actually looked into different program locations and thought about her personal goals and her academic goals and ended up finding, you know, other programs that, that fit those needs better. Um, so I do, you know, I just, I liked that quote too, because, you know, nothing against Spain. I studied abroad in Germany. So I studied abroad in Western Europe because I was a German major. So I kind of, you know, that made the most sense. But I think a lot of students are kind of just drawn to places because of their peers. And, you know, because you hear other people saying um, that they're going to Spain or they're going to Western Europe. And so um, it's important just to kind of take a moment and think about what it is that you want to get out of the experience and make sure that's the best fit. And then these are just some, some benefits of non-traditional locations that I wanted to mention. I think cost is one of, you know, the, the biggest benefits, you know, especially if you, for example, if you are learning Spanish and you want to study abroad and practice your Spanish going somewhere like Uruguay or Chile is definitely going to be a lot more affordable than, you know, than going to Spain where, um, you know, it's a bit more expensive. Um, also getting around, you know, within the country, I'm sure Kent can speak to that in India, it's probably very, very cheap, you know, to get around um, and eat and, you know, just cost of living. Um, and there's also often more scholarship, um, there are more scholarship opportunities for non-traditional locations. So, just from a financial perspective, it can often be, you know, much more affordable um, and, you know, just increases your ability to set yourself apart. So studying abroad also already does that because a small, you know, 4% of, or something like, something very low like that, um, very small percentage of, of undergraduate students in the U.S. actually study abroad. Um, so then you are kind of setting yourself apart even more by, by choosing a, a less traditional location. Um, and I, you know, Kent already talked about this increasing your adaptability. So just putting yourself in these unknown situations where, you know, you, you don't know what the head bobble means and how do you figure that out? Um, and, and, you know, for, for myself, even though I was in a, a European location, I just had never experienced the lack of lines before. Like Germans are known for being very rule oriented and very structured, except when it comes to lines. And so trying to figure out how to like get anything in a shop or get on a bus or anything, I ended up having to throw a few elbows, which was like not, you know, very much not my personality, but you at first have to like figure out how things work and then you, uh, you know, adapt to that and jump right in. So it just increases that even more when you're in a place that is that much different than, than where you're from. Um, and many students will say that, you know, when they're in a place that is not as common for American tourists. There aren't as many Americans there, um, or even you know Western tourists. It's just it feels to them that it's a bit more authentic because they're not 
you know, they're, they're, they are away from what they're used to and, and the locals are not used to having as many Americans or Western tourists. So they're not adapting every, they're not offering, you know, burgers at every restaurant to, you know, to adapt to the, the American population. So you're just having that more authentic experience. So anyway, just some, just my two cents about the benefits. Awesome, good stuff. Um, so now we're going to transition into talking a little bit about CIS abroad, uh, from me and then a USAC from, from Rachel. So just a few things about CIS, um, things that I think are, are really important to, to our staff. One is affordability. We try to make our programs as affordable as possible. Um, two is support. So you're supported at every step of the process when you participate in a CIS abroad program, whether it's in the application phase or when you arrive on site and are met by our site director at the airport to kind of introduce you to your new home for, for however long you've chosen to study there. And then the third piece is cultural immersion. You know, that cultural immersion piece is really foundation for, it's foundational for all of our programs. Um, so we have what we call our La Vida Local Cultural Curriculum, um, where we give our site directors a lot of freedom to really create programming that connects students um, with the local culture. So that is an important aspect of our programs as well. Go ahead and click Yuki. And, there are a few, um, well, these are these are awards CIS abroad has won, so I always have to brag about these. Um, <laughs> but there are a few resources here. Um, these awards are specifically from goabroad.com and gooverseas.com, which I would highly recommend looking into, um, especially if you're if you're thinking about a non-traditional location. I took advantage of these resources as an undergrad. Um, there's just a lot of great content, so I recommend checking those out. Next slide. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about locations. You can go ahead and go on to the next one. Okay, so like I said earlier, we're focusing specifically on um, the Americas and Ecuador. Uh, <laughs> yes, the Americas and Ecuador. Uh, you can edit that part. <laughs> the, the Americas and Africa. So uh, for, for CIS abroad, um, in the Americas we have 18 programs in five different countries. So you can see them listed here. Um, in Quito, Ecuador, we offer two programs um, for semester and summer study abroad. Buenos Aires, Argentina, we have one program at the University of Belgrano. And then I think there's one more to pop up. If you click one, see. Oh, yes. So um, our programs in San Jose, Costa Rica are another option. And you'll see here um, the fifth country, um, or sorry, the fourth country is Peru, uh, which I won't be speaking about today, but then also we have a program in Hawaii, which is a little um, sort of traditional, non-traditional, depending on your perspective. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and in Africa, click once more. I didn't do the transitions all that well on this slide. Um, so in Africa, we have uh, two programs in South Africa. So one at the University of Cape Town, and then one at the University of Stellenbosch, just a little bit outside of Cape Town. So now I want to, I have three, I chose three programs from, from the list on these two continents that I just wanna talk a little bit more about. Um, one, the first one being semester in Costa Rica. Um, so this program is, is based at the University of Veritas. This is like a small private college it's, it's pretty central in San Jose, which is the capital, which is right in the middle of Costa Rica. So if you're interested in traveling to different parts of the country, this is a, a really great kind of home base. Um, I really like this program because even though it's a small university, the, uh, the range of courses is quite broad. So if you're a STEM major, you might be interested specifically in the environmental studies um, track that they have. There's also lots of biology courses. There are some health courses. Um, specifically around um, Latin American healthcare. And also there's some fun courses specifically focused on um, vocabulary, Spanish vocabulary for health professionals, which might be useful if you're looking into that. Um, but then there are also elective courses. So if you're interested in taking art or design, architecture, um, Veritas is kind of known in that area quite, quite a lot. And then there are social sciences courses and of course, Spanish coursework as well. It's also one of our most affordable programs anywhere in the world, um, which, you know, as Rachel mentioned, is, is a huge benefit of going to less traditional locations. 
we'll move on to the next one. Ooh, great, great formatting. <laughs> so um, interesting. Sorry about that. Yeah, but no the, just how it was downloaded. Yeah, no problem. So um, this program is, you can probably see, our semester in South Africa at the University of Cape Town. So the University of Cape Town is actually the number one university, not in, in uh, South Africa, but in all of Africa. Um, so it's a very prestigious institution. If you're interested in having that kind of on your resume, it's, it's definitely an academic boost there. Um, and the, the benefit of studying here really, besides its location, which is, as you can see here in the photo on the left, very, um, very much at the, the bottom of some of the beautiful mountains in the city of Cape Town. Um, the benefits are around academics. It's, it's a very large institution for, um, for Africa, and there are going to be a lot of different um, areas you could go into. So this is a location where you could probably take a full course load of, of uh, STEM courses, you know, regardless of your major. Um, and UCT is ranked very highly in a lot of different areas, um, not only in Africa, but around the world. Um, so as you can see, you know, at the bottom, we do, we try to build in a lot of different um, excursions on our program. So really opportunities for students to connect with, um, with people, but also the, the local uh, flora and fauna, the landscape. So on this program, we do uh, excursions to the Cape Point Nature Reserve, we climb Table Mountain. Um, and then there's also um, a four day optional um, safari that you can participate in. There's one more. So this will be our um, semester in Ecuador at um, the uh, Universidad Internacional del Ecuador. So this again is a, is a smaller um, private institution. It's a little bit outside of Quito. So the photo on the top left is actually a really good representation of the school itself and then the mountains in the background and then Quito uh, down below in the valley. So that is, um, or, or this, University is an international university, um, so that means a lot of students here are uh, are from Ecuador, but they're taking internationally focused coursework. Um, so uh, many of them will probably have a, a good amount of English. Um, our students on this program tend to get really involved in campus activities. Um, so this institution in particular is known for having great sport and recreation facilities. So there's like a like a dirt bike trail. There's, you know, it's like amenities heavy, I, I guess I would say. Um, so if you're interested in that sort of, um, you know, campus environment and really being immersed in, in among local Ecuadorian students, that is particularly interesting. Um, in terms of coursework, I would say you know, they're, they're not going to be a ton of courses in, in the STEM fields. Um, I think there are some in engineering and some in the biological sciences. So if that um, is, is of interest, definitely check out the course list. But if you are a student that has a business major, this would be a really solid option. Um, so you can take some of those business courses and then obviously, you know, gen ed requirements and things like that are available there as well. And last thing I'll say, okay, two more things I'll say about this program. Um, there is an optional homestay. So if you're interested in really being immersed in, in practicing Spanish, um, I would really recommend um, going for a homestay option as opposed to the student apartments. And then lastly, just of interest to STEM majors in particular probably would be um, the Galapagos, which are part of Ecuador. Um, it's a quick flight from Quito to go and discover this incredible landscape. So kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity there. And that is all I have for you. So um, if you're interested in any of these opportunities, feel free to reach out to us. Um, at cisabroad.com. And with that, I will pass it over to Rachel to talk about um, USAC options. Okay, I'm a bit jealous of your PowerPoint template. Ours is a, is a little less uh, fun. <laughs> but anyway, so again, I'm from USAC or University Studies Abroad Consortium. So we're another partner of Clemson. So I have a couple other opportunities to share with you. Um, and Yuki, if you wanna, thank you. Um, so, I won't go over the why study abroad necessarily because if you're watching this, then you were interested, so you're already, you know, already that one step ahead. But those are some of the some of the reasons that and that um, K 
Kent already touched on, you know, a few in terms of uh, preparing you, you know, for your, or, or building your skills related to your future career. Um, in terms of information about USAC, um, we, you know, we tend to be known, I would say, for uh, locations. So the, the, our program locations, this, either the cities or the countries where our programs are, lo are located, they tend to be um, outside of the, the larger cities, the more, you know, touristy areas. So with a few exceptions, we do have a, a Shanghai program and a Madrid program. So we have a couple um, like that, but then, you know, many of our program locations tend to be in, in medium-sized cities like, you know, Reggio Emilia, Italy, which you may have never heard of before, but it's a lovely medium-sized city in Italy that has a large university and very few other, you know, American students studying abroad. So we really try to focus on um, you know, provide, helping you, uh, providing you with an authentic experience, an authentic um, cultural experience uh, where you are. And then also affordability, like Ken said, that's probably the other thing um, like CIS abroad that we're known for is um, more affordable programs, which also I think ties into those locations because again, you know, as I mentioned earlier with non-traditional um, countries, you know, that is often a benefit that the, the cost of living there is lower, which, you know, all of that translate to a, translates to a lower program fee. Um, or if you're in a place like Italy, which is a more traditional location for study abroad, but in a city like Reggio Emilia, you know, it's going, the cost of living there, you know, everything kind of related to the program is going to be more affordable than if you were in Rome or Florence or, you know, somewhere like that. Um, so those are the two main things I would say that we tend to be known for. Um, we do have over 50 program locations. And in terms of the support, you know, I think that um, that's probably something that many organizations would say is this is, you know, the support that we provide, you know, from when you apply all the way through, you know, when you're abroad and then coming home um, is something else that, that we pride ourselves on that individualized um, support from USAC staff, both in the US and abroad. Um, and there are other opportunities that you can take advantage of while you're abroad, internships, volunteering, you know, field trips, things like that. Um, and we've been doing this since 1982. So probably before many of you, or hopefully before many of you were born. Um, so just to say that we've been around for a long time, we have a lot of experience, we've learned, you know, a lot of lessons through the years. And, um, and so we, you know, we're, are proud of that, that history and that longevity. Um, so that's just a, brief overview of USAC. Um, and this are, these are just some screenshots of the website. There's some QR codes that will take you there um, as well, just to, you know, highlight the program search tool, which will, you know, is where you can, um, you know, look up your major. There are different areas, you know, there's science and math and engineering, and there are going to be different sub-majors, you know, under that, or, you know, humanities or business or whatever. So that's just a way to to search for programs that would match with your major on the website and then kind of dig in for more details. So you know how to use websites, but I just like to throw that in there. Um, in terms of our programs before I, I have, a, I'll have a few examples as well, but I do like to highlight these program models just because um, we have the ones I'm gonna show you kind of, there's, they're kind of from both areas. So I just like to explain this um, concept um, as you start to look you know, at programs. So we have what we call specialty programs and partnership programs. Um, and they, you know, both have, you know, they're slightly different and have different benefits, you know, depending on the student. Um, so for specialty programs, those are, are USAC programs. Those are programs that USAC has created um, at a, a host university overseas. So Costa Rica, for example, is one that I'll, I'll show you. Um, so they're based at a university, but we have a USAC resident director and staff, and they have an office there on campus. The classrooms are on campus. Um, so you have those, those immersion opportunities to be on campus, take advantage of the, the resources there that the university has, but you are in classes with USAC students. So you have that connection to your, to your group there as well. And, and typically, unless they are language classes, um, the classes will be taught in English um, by local faculty. So that opens up, you know, if that university, for example, doesn't offer classes in English in environmental science, you know, we've created a program that that does offer those classes in English, but the local faculty are teaching it. So you have that opportunity, you know, to study at the university and be immersed, but also have that that USAC um, support um, and network there. Um, so there are, you know, field trips and activities and things that are arranged by the on-site staff. Um, now, the, the coursework tends to be more limited because 
you don't have access to the full university curriculum because it's probably taught you know in that local language um, and so each specialty program will have specific academic areas of focus so <clears throat> in san ramon costa rica it's and, you know, life sciences, health sciences, Spanish language, um, Latin American studies. So you couldn't necessarily, you know, take business classes or, you know, other things. So that, so that's one difference with the partnership programs. Those are essentially direct enroll programs. Um, so you're a student at the university there. Um, you receive a transcript from that university. You have access to, you know, the, the full curriculum of classes. Um, but we don't have USAC staff there on site. Um, we typically partner with the, the study abroad office or the international office there to, to help provide that support. So you're there with a group of USAC students, but part of the larger international student group and you attend you know, the orientation and the activities and field trips and things that the university offers. Um, and so you know, one of the benefits to that is that you have access to more courses and this is often you know, a better fit for STEM students um, because you, you know, can take classes from many departments at the universities, um, but maybe slightly more independent than a specialty program where you have that, you know, USAC staff and that kind of um, extra layer of support. So there are just some, you know, pros and cons differences between the two. Both are going to be, um, you know, amazing experiences and you still have, you know, regardless, you have the same uh, support from our office staff, you know, our US based office from the point, you know, from when you apply all the way to when you when you come back. So that support is there as well. They're just, you know, slightly different uh, program models. So I just like to explain that before I get into the programs. And so I just have a couple examples as well. We have um, in Latin America, we have programs in Costa Rica, um, Uruguay, Chile, uh, Brazil and also Cuba. We have summer programs in Cuba. And I don't think I included a list like Kent did, so my apologies. Um, and so I, but I'm just highlighting the Costa Rica program. So if you, thank you. Um, so this is one example of a program in Latin America that would have, um, you know, would perhaps work for STEM majors depending on your, your area of, um, of study. Um, so the program is based in San Ramon, Costa Rica, which is kind of halfway in between um, San Jose and the coast. So it's, you know, and it's a small country, so it's very easy. And Yuki's been there, so she can probably speak to that too. Um, and it's at the University of Costa Rica. It's a, a campus uh, uh, outside of San Jose um, in San Ramon. And so we have um, a fall, spring, and then two summer sessions. So those are the terms that are available. And then I've just included some sample courses just to give you an idea. Um, so in addition to Spanish language, either Spanish language, literature, we also have a, a Spanish for medical professions. Um, and then in addition to that, there are, you know, some of these sample courses. So biological diversity, cell biology, um, ecology and population biology. So the, they're courses that do have a lab component um, and we have cell biology, thanks to Clemson, I would say, thanks to UP, she got that, that going for us. Um, and so this is just a sampling of some uh, biology courses or science courses that would be offered there. So taught in English, but they're taught by faculty from, from the university. So you're, you know, you still get that, um, that experience um, with the, with the host university faculty. And then again, other academic opportunities, definitely Spanish language, literature, culture. Um, so we do have students on this program who are not taking science classes. It just kind of depends on, on what they need. Um, we also have internships there, which, you know, currently are on hold just because of, of the pandemic, but typically we have students interning in local um, healthcare facilities. So we kind of have the, health, the, the healthcare facility internships and then research internships. So for students who are more interested in doing behind the scenes um, research, we, we also have uh, internship placements there for research um, or research placements. And then we have had many students who've interned in um, a local clinic, a local hospital um, with physicians. So it's a good fit for, um, for students kind of looking towards the, the health fields, it, the internships anyway. Um, so that's one program. Um, I had mentioned Ghana earlier in that quote. And so I definitely wanted to highlight our program in Accra at the University of Ghana. Um, the terms that are available there are fall, spring, and then we also have two summer sessions, although the summer sessions are more, um, more focused on African um, 
culture and history and, and society and, and not really with, with a STEM focus. So those classes would be more during the fall and spring. And so these are some sample departments um, because this, this program is a bit of a hybrid of both specialty and partnership. Um, so we have a resident director and, and staff there. And so the, the, it has the specialty components of um, there are USAC courses that are offered um, for students, but then students also have the opportunity of enrolling directly at the University of Ghana and taking, you know, any courses that they need to there. So we kind of have a mixture of some students who will just take the USAC courses, some will just take the University of Ghana courses, but many of them will take, you know, take both. Um, so they get that, you know, the, the support in with their, their USAC um, peers, but then also being able to, to take classes directly at the University of Ghana um, because the classes are taught in English. And so these are some departments um, at the university where you could take classes. Agriculture, I know there are a lot of uh, majors within that area at Clemson. Health sciences, you know, various sciences, um, physics, chemistry, things like that. Um, different areas of engineering, statistics, even pharmacology. So um, so there's a lot available there for, for STEM students um, and other opportunities. A lot of our students in Ghana will volunteer, get involved in, um, you know, with local organizations, whether that's through the service learning course, which is credit bearing, or just, you know, volunteering um, just to get involved in the community. Um, and because, you know, you are, uh, because students have the kind of both the specialty and partnership models there they can really get involved in um, campus sports and clubs and and there's a buddy program so we have our um uh there's students at the university of ghana who are paired up with our usac students and they're a great resource for learning how to get around um you know the city and meeting other local ghanaian students and um, they actually live in the residence hall where the the usac students live so they're a great a great resource um, and then the last one that I wanted to share is our Stellenbosch program. So we also have a program in South Africa at Stellenbosch, uh, University of Stellenbosch. Um, and we have fall, it's kind of like Ghana. So we have fall and spring semesters, and then there's a summer program, but it doesn't really have a, as much of a STEM or engineering and computer science focus as it does, you know, other areas of um, South African uh, politics and history and culture, public health, things like that. Um, but some of the departments um, there also include computer science, different sciences, different types of engineering. So again, this could be a really good fit for, um, for a student who needs um, some, you know, very specific STEM classes. And I know STEM kind of involves a whole lot of different majors, so I'm, I'm generalizing a lot here. Um, and again, that, you know, most of the university is taught or most of the curriculum is taught in English. They do have some classes that are taught in Afrikaans. So we do help students figure out which classes, you know, are available to them. Um, but there are many, you know, mainstream classes that, that are taught in English that they can choose from. Um, and then they're also kind of like in Ghana, there are courses taught specifically for international students um, about um, South African and African, you know, politics and history and culture to, to help you acclimate to where you're living and, and better understand the context of, of where you're living. Um, so again, you know, students can get really involved in, cam in the campus activities, sports clubs, things like that. They also have a buddy program. Um, and we have this in a lot of our, uh, almost all of our program locations. And, and I did that as well when I studied abroad and it was great because it's, a you know, sometimes you have trouble um, it can be a little daunting trying to meet, you know, new people. It's daunting to meet new people in your own culture, to be honest, I think. But, you know, to then go to a foreign country and try to, you know, make new friends and meet new people. And so I found personally that the, the buddy that I had was a really great resource for feeling more comfortable and, and asking questions that maybe I wouldn't feel comfortable asking the international office, but that, you know, he was really um, helpful and that I met some of his friends. And so that's a great way to to, to start to meet people. Um, and it's also right there in wine country. So if you want to, to explore, um, to start a new hobby, uh, definitely check out wine country. Um, so those are just some highlights of those three programs. We have, you know, like I said, many, many others, but those were just a few from these specific areas that I wanted to highlight. And um, kind of like Kent, this is how you can how you can find us, ask us questions on our, you know, our website is usac.edu. Um, you can also email our main email address. 
Um, we can, you know, connect you with the program advisor for a specific program and doing lots of virtual advising these days. So lots of virtual meetings. So that's USAC in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Kent and Rachel. There are great opportunities for you all. And I want to highlight, yeah, some of the programs, for example, um, San Ramon, Costa Rica, we have worked with USAC to, you know, create a new course <laughs> like cell biology, um, you know, or uh, I have worked with, you know, Kent to get more courses approved for science or, you know, engineering students, STEM students, so that uh, you can, um, uh, you have less barriers, I would say, uh, because I know a lot of Clemson students uh, feel like it, getting all the courses evaluated and approved is a long and a tiring process, but we, we will try to, you know, we have been and will continue to, you know, make that process easier uh, so that um, science and uh, SICA students can um, participate in um, study of programs um, more smoothly and easier. So the access, we are trying to really, you know, um, make it, make the study more accessible for STEM students as well. So, Jonesy, do you have any questions or any, anything to add? Um, um, I was just going to add in that I completely agree with everything they said and that I actually participated in a USAC program in Heredia, Costa Rica. So as an alumni of a USAC program, as well as just a program in a non-traditional location in Latin America, I everything that Kent and Rachel said is true and picking that location was part cost, part wanting to be somewhere that not everybody studies abroad to be able to set myself apart and say, yes, not only did I study abroad, but I went somewhere that not everybody else goes, that you have to push yourself a little bit more um, in the personal growth that you gain through doing that is really incredible and wonderful. Um, and we are so thankful to have partners like uh, Kent and Rachel to work with our students on these programs. And we will support you if you have questions coming um, to me and Yuki to get started in the process and then they will help you as well from the minute you are interested in a program until you arrive like they said in the airport and you don't feel like you get there and no one's there for you like it you are supported from the moment you arrive to in-country support and coming back around so that's just what I wanted to add in that it really was a wonderful personal experience to pick a program that is in a, a more non-traditional location um, in Costa Rica is a beautiful, wonderful country. It's no wonder that, you know, a lot of study abroad programs have programs in Costa Rica because it's affordable, beautiful. Um, and I did Spanish minor classes, but there were, as they were saying, a lot of environmental science um, and bio biological science students there as well. Um, so look into it. I know within engineering, we have environmental engineering and biosystems engineering. So both of those kind of line up as well. That is what I wanted to add. Thank you. Great, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Jonesy made a good point because students don't need to take just major courses. You know, um, you can do, um, can't mention in the Ecuador program, I think uh, there, if you're a business minor, um, which, some students are actually, uh, and some seeker students as well. Um, then maybe Ecuador is a great option if you know some students have uh, is measuring uh, in science or seekers, but have a business minor and a Spanish minor, like double you know minors, and Ecuador might be the best option. Uh, so you know just keep in mind um, or keep being um, open minded. And we can help Jonesy and I can help you. So you now see on the screen uh, that uh, the contact information of uh, Jonesy and uh, mine, and you can reach out to us. Uh, you can make an appointment uh, via CU Navigate, schedule an advising appointment. We are um, open, I would say, during the summer as well. <laughs> so throughout the semester, academic year, as well as during the summer, um, you can definitely make an appointment with us and just um, explore options because sometimes students just think they can only go uh, for a summer or students can, uh, may think uh, they can only go to yes, yeah, Spain or Italy or the UK or Australia. That is not true. A lot of the times other uh, destinations like non-traditional destinations work better for some students. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. So again, this is our contact information and 
Thank you once again uh, for Rachel and Kent to join us today. And we really appreciate your uh, expertise and support because they have been wonderful colleagues to work with, providers to work with. And I know uh, our students really enjoyed uh, going through um, them to, uh, for their study abroad experience. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for watching this uh, recording and we hope to work with you very soon. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you.